to be guided in our lives. And we thank you again, Lord, that uh, we have the freedom to, to read your word together quite openly here this morning. So for each and every one of us, we pray, Lord, that you will bless us, you will help us to, um, to give, to share your love with others around us. And we ask this for your glory in the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. Amen. So this morning, I've got um, a lesson from Daniel. Daniel chapter 1. And uh, just given it a title on moral decisions. Daniel chapter 1 is probably quite familiar with most of us, but we are definitely going to read read through Daniel chapter 1 and make sure that um, it's fresh in our mind. So I just actually need to get hold of this. Uh, turn this on, don't I? Right. So the key points this morning to look out for. A knowledge of God's word equips us for making moral decisions in our lives. But we must take care that we don't cause other believers to stumble. Okay? So bear that in mind. Those are, those are the things that we're, that we're looking forward to today, to try and, to try and uh, to take away. Now, um, oh, sorry, I'm pressing this and I'm not mean to. Right, okay. I have to be more careful with that. Back in history, after, um, after the flood, there was um, a movement of the people across the world. Hem, uh, there was uh, Ham, Shem and Japheth. And uh, from Ham's line, there was um, a guy called Nimrod who was uh, mentioned in Genesis chapter 10 as being... Before the Lord, a great hunter. And uh, when you read about Nimrod, you, you, you get the feeling that um, he and God weren't on the same page. Nimrod left uh, out the, um, the, the, the command to go and spread around the world. He wanted to stay in one place. And um, we read in Genesis 10 that, that um, he, his uh, kingdom started off with Akkad um, and Babylon, or Babel as it was called then, and uh, he was right, probably the very first empire that was uh, going to be occupying the world. So Nimrod um, was the start of, uh, of Babel, or Babylon. And you might remember that in chapter 11 of Genesis, there was... Uh, a movement by the people who got together and said, well, well let's, let's create a big tower towards the heavens. And at that time, everyone spoke the same language in that area. And God intervened because he was fearful that the united efforts of, of people was going to bring trouble. So that's in Genesis chapter 10 and 11. Have a read. Um, uh, I recommend you have a read for the context so this city, Babylon, was started back then. And then we're going through the history and there was an envoy sent to the king Hezekiah of Judah. And we're now in, in uh, 700 years before Christ. And this envoy came to see Hezekiah and we're going to pick up um, a conversation between Hezekiah and Isaiah. So the... the the envoy was sent by a, Babylon, a Babylonian king called Merodach uh, Baladin. This is, seem, seems to shoot forward when I don't want it to, but there we go. So, this king of Babylon sent Hezekiah his best wishes. Because Hezekiah, just in verses preceding this, we'll learn that Hezekiah had been ill. Ill unto death. And he was only a young man, really, at 39, I think he was. And he wanted to live a little bit longer, but that's another story. But he'd been very ill unto death, and he was recovering. And uh, this Babylon king, Babylonian king had heard that he had been very sick. So he sent him a gift. Now, Hezekiah received the Babylonian envoy, 
and he showed him everything that was in his treasure houses. Okay? I want to pick out the, um, this king's name. It's uh, Baal has given me a son. So we're going to pick up this theme of these different names of the different kings from Babylon as we go through. <coughs> right. So Isaiah asks Hezekiah, what did those men want? Why were they here? Hezekiah says, well, they're from Babylon. Turn it again. I've been technical deeds, uh, problems here, guys. Can we can can we do that? Oh, just for some reason, it's just I'll, I'll try a bit harder to. I'm not actually conscious I'm doing anything, but no. Can we go back to? Um, it's just shooting through on its own. <laughs> can we go back to slide um, number four, please? Thank you. Sorry about this, guys. Right, now we'll move to five, then we'll get ourselves on the right page. Thanks. So, um, yeah, just to repeat that, they saw, Hezekiah showed them right through all his treasure uh, houses and his storehouses. Slide number six, please. Do I turn this off? Right. Are we good now? Right, okay, thanks. Put that away. So, um, listen to this message from the Lord, Hezekiah, uh, Isaiah says to Hezekiah. He says, The time is coming when everything in your palace, all of the treasures stored up by your ancestors until now, will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. Some of your very own sons will be taken into exile. And they will become eunuchs who will serve in the palace of Babylon's king. That's in 2 Kings chapter 20. So this takes us quite nicely up to um, Daniel chapter 1. Now in those days um, they have this term eunuch which was actually quite uh, uh, probably a different meaning to what we know of now. And it was uh, like in a, a chief official and our Bibles and various translations Give, uh, give this title, but this, this was a, um, issued by uh, Isaiah a hundred years before the first verse that we're going to read now in Daniel chapter 1. So it takes us into the first verse, and if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to read together Daniel chapter 1, starting at verse 1. So during the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. And train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens, and they were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, and Azariah was called Abednego. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I am afraid of my lord the king who has offered that you 
sorry, who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I am afraid the king will have me beheaded. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food, and then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. And whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balance of judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. So this was the start of 70 years of captivity for the Jews. This had been um, prophesied by, by Jeremiah. I think we'll have the um, slide eight, please. Thanks. Uh, just, just back one, please. Thanks. Just before we, we move on, let's pick out some of these key points that uh, we can see about God's sovereignty from this chapter. The Lord gave Nebuchadnezzar victory over Jehoiakim and permitted him to take some of the treasures from the storehouse of the temple. God gave Daniel favour and compassion and God gave them learning and skill. So these things didn't just happen. They were, the scripture says, they were definitely given and permitted by God. So Jehoiakim remains in Jerusalem as a vassal king. And um, Nebuchadnezzar, this is the first visit to Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. And he takes away, he's permitted to take away some of the sacred objects, takes them back to his to his place in Babylon. So we're going to look at, on slide nine, some, inset, some insights into the Babylonians. So Nebuchadnezzar, so Nebuch, Nebuch, uh, slide nine please, Nebuchadnezzar took back these uh, treasures and he put them into his own storehouse, the treasure house of his God. Now, this morning we're going to just consider that Babylon was a place that was absolutely rife with idolatry, goddesses and gods with little g. This god that he, um, that he, he was worshipping here, we're not told in this passage uh, the name of this particular god, but we do know that the patron god of um, Babylon was Bel, and he had various different names. We had a look before on the other slide, and we saw for our god, Yahweh, we have uh, Adonai mentioned in the first part of the scripture, and then later in the text, Elohim in Hebrew. And so too, when you come across scripture, you find Bel is refer referred to as Marduk or Merodach. He has different names too. And it's, um, so sometimes we think we've got, uh, it, when we're reading about uh, Babylon, we think maybe we get confused. So we just need to, to be aware that there, there are different names for the same god and goddesses. Babylon, we read in the literature, their own literature, was a place that was very, very superstitious. They had um, initially started off worshipping uh, the, the natural forces and then eventually 
as time went by, they put these natural forces of sun and the spirits into handmade idols. And we, we had that from um, Psalm 135 this morning. Idols made with hands. They had a place for, um, we're told, for heaven and a place for which there was no, no return, which is thought to be maybe equivalent to, to hell in the scripture. They even had hymns and texts that, that represent what we, they seem to be like hymns and praise to their, to their false gods. They were an intent, of all intents and purposes, quite a religious, and I use that word because of the activity of going to their temples and invoking gods for the different parts of their lives. We're told that the kings would invoke the different gods as far as they would, whether or not there would be success in, in war and campaign and things like this. So Daniel is, has now found himself in an environment which is surrounding himself with the uh, false gods and idols. There is one text that refers to great fear that the Babylonians had of evil spirits. In fact, um, the text communicates that they were more afraid of the spirits than they were of, of, uh, of gods, their idols. Jeremiah, in slide 10, he quotes, um, that's, yeah, slide, slide 10, please, there we go. In chapter 50, Babylon, he says, it's a land of images and of idols. They are mad with idols. That's the kind of place that, that Daniel is in now. In scripture, we'll just quickly look at uh, slide 11. We've got some where the names of different, these different uh, gods come in. And th what we're doing here is just getting a feel. We've got a series going through Daniel, and we're just trying to create this uh, little bit of background around the environment that Daniel, Meshach, and Abednego are in. Bel is put to shame. Merodach is dismayed in Jeremiah. I will punish Bel in Babylon. Bel bows down. Nebo stoops. Nebo was the son, apparently, of, of Bel. Um, yeah, number 10, please. That would be good. I don't know why things are doing this, but there we go. Um, oh, sorry, I think I've led you wrong there. Number 11, please. Uh, thanks. Now, um, another one there, another reference is in Ezekiel, Tammuz. And I've just put that in because how often do we read things like this um, and we, we just don't know what the scripture is talking about? I, I actually found out myself for the first time. God was taking, um, giving a picture of, the, of how the uh, Israelites um, were, were in, in, room, in dark rooms and they were actually uh, had incense offering God, to, uh, worship to pagan gods. And the Lord was saying, this is an abomination, this is an abomination to me, and, and yet you'll see more abominations. And he went into another place and came across women who sat weeping for Tammuz. Now, um, just so, you know, something like that, he's, a, he's another god. And, um, and apparently um, the, the, they have mythology around this guy too because he, uh, he was sought after by a goddess who was continually weeping for the loss of her loved one, who was Tammuz. So the difference in Babylon is we have this pantheon of gods uh, the three big gods they have, who then were married and had sons and daughters who were gods and goddesses, and it just proliferated on. So it started off with, the, with their worship of, of, of the uh, physical forces and then developed on and on and on. Oh, I need to speed up, sorry. But I would point out there that um, the Baal is Arcadian form of Baal. So Baal, we all know, is, is a, we're familiar with Baal, perhaps more so than Baal. Arkad was one of those cities that Nimrod uh, founded back in Genesis 10. You'll see that. Okay. So, um, right, that's shoot, shooting on then. So, um, slide 12 
Ecclesiastes says whatever has been done will be and what has been done, sorry, what has been will be and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. So very quickly, we've got a, we can see there, we mentioned Ishtar. Ishtar was the one who chased Tammuz before. Ishtar is known as Ashtaroth, the queen of heaven to the Hebrews. Then the Greeks get influenced. They take on Astarte. They take on Aphrodite. Later gets renamed as Artemis, which we've come across in Ephesians. And then the Romans are influenced by the Greeks. They take on Diana. All the same deity, the goddess of Ishtar, of fertility and war. So why am I bringing this to point? Because uh, man always needs a substitute. He's looking for someone to take the place of God all the time. And they take... Right through history, they are taking these uh, false gods. But Daniel, uh, let's look at, at uh, slide 13. Daniel was now in an environment where these false gods were, were everywhere for him. But he wouldn't compromise. This is interesting, isn't it? He, wouldn't, he, he, he compromised on education and language and literature. I would suggest. And also he took on a change of name. There's no objection recorded in those areas. But with tact, he did object to the change, of, to, the, to the diet that was presented to him. Food from the king's table. Now, we can be sure that eating certain foods, he would know, would, would make him unclean. He knew the scriptures. And so therefore, what, if he did defile himself by eating those foods, he would displease God and he would defile himself. So Daniel, let's look at slide 14, is now, his education is this. This is the cuneiform script. The, we have a lot of history, and the museums are full of this. It's a wedge type of writing, gives us lots of detail. So we have the next slide, please. His education would also come into this. Now below this slide we've got absolutely loads of um, script. I mean that's a very small part of that picture that I've highlighted. The majority of it is all Aramaic script to describe this. This, I just point out, is very old. Very old. Nebuchadnezzar would have seen this. His, his father uh, repaired this tablet. Okay. This is the um, stone tablet of Shamash, the sun god. He's, you see him, he's very characteristic. He's on the right-hand side. I'll point out he's got three stars above. We've got, on the right, we've got Ishtar, star of Venus, morning star. We've got the sun god star. We've got the moon. Those are those three circular ones to the uh, 11 o'clock of, of Shamash. And then we've got three figures uh, bringing worship before a symbol of Shamash. So, again... This is in the Babylonian literature and language that Daniel is with. Let's look at the name changes that were brought on. So in um, the next slide, yeah. So we can see that the chief would, was trying to take away any remembrance. Perhaps it, was a, 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 it would have been a hopeless effort because I'm sure that Daniel wouldn't have really carried around this name. But... We can see that name changes all mean something away from God, our God. Bel, Aku, Nebo, Aku, they're all different gods, they're little idols in Babylon. But he took that name, we're not, he didn't, we're not aware that he objected to taking that name. Let's uh, we'll move on to 17. So the king assigned um, different, uh, yeah, daily a portion of food from his table. So, and Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food. Just put one reference up there that um, Leviticus has, and it's the same in Genesis, but the, I think, or similar. Um, you must never eat food, eat fat or blood. This is a permanent law for you. Let's move on to 18. Now I've, uh, initially, uh, when you read this, you think, oh, it's probably because he was uh, not sure about the food that had been offered. 
from the king's table had it been had it been in, offered to idols and to be honest i just can't find a reference that actually says that the uh, specifically that we know that the food from the king's table was offered to idols but it's i've given you two references there one 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 body says yes another body says there's no indication that that was the case but daniel would be aware that um, there are unclean foods. He knew, that, he knew that rule in Leviticus. There's a whole long list. Genesis 9 uh, and Leviticus uh, 3, talking about um, not taking uh, blood. And I do have, I have read that uh, the uh, Babylonians mixed their wine with blood. They mixed, they had that mix for some reason. And so we do know too that, um, that Daniel would be aware that idolatry was no there was no place for him he didn't want to associate with the idol worship so he had knowledge of scripture prepared for him uh, and with that he could make his moral decision we all come across decisions every day or we have we have um, issues in our uh, in our lives today which uh, for some believers they are gray and for some re- believers they are black and white Now, um, an example, an example of this would be, um, for example, taking away the end of the end of life bill, for example, would, would be one. And another one would be protection for the unborn child. And I want to suggest to you this morning that um, where there are areas for yourselves that are um, possibly grey, because you're not sure then spend time in the Word specifically looking at these at scriptures that are going to give you some guidance as an individual before God. And, um, and that's the, the, the best recommendation I can, I can make. All, um, believers have lots of different views. We don't all agree about everything. That's, that's, that's a fact in life today. And so we cannot, we must be careful that... Um, from our own understanding, we don't, we don't uh, adversely affect someone else, and which we'll come to in a minute. Right. So, uh, slide 19. It wasn't a light thing to stand up to Nebuchadnezzar. He um, has a lot of things in secular history which I wouldn't even want to mention here this morning. But we can see from Scripture that he was a king who wouldn't balk at uh, throwing people alive into a furnace. He had no problem with blinding somebody. Oh, um, sorry, King, Z- King Zedekiah of, of Israel there, he, was, had to, he had to see his own son slain before him, before his eyes were taken out. Nebuchadnezzar was a, actually a gruesome tyrant of a, of a man at that time. So it would be no light thing that Daniel did. And we, we read this, but, you know, he possibly, he, yes, it was a, oh, I can only, only say that it's no light thing what he was doing, standing up for his God at that time. So, um, yes, yeah, slide 20, please. I'm just going to uh, look into the New Testament. Um, there was a, a time when uh, the early church had differences, and uh, we, we perhaps, um, some of us might uh, remember Galatians, where the, the church in Antioch, um, the, the, the new Christians were being given new rules, uh, or sorry, old rules to, to, to um, and they need, apparently the Jewish Christians wanted the new Gentile believers to follow the old Jewish customs as well as, as be believers. And so there was, a, there was trouble in the church and they met together, the leaders in Jerusalem. And if we look at um, slide, can we have slide 20? Um, the apostles got together and we read uh, our um, slide uh, 21. Please. Yeah, thanks very much. And we read this, we read, the final judgment was that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who were turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from food that has been offered to idols and from immorality. So 
So the new church um, was given that, that instruction. And then we're just going to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And uh, I just, it's not a long chapter, and I think it's got such, it's, it, it is pretty helpful for us in this. He says, now regarding your questions about food that has been offered to idols, yes, we know that we all have knowledge about this issue. But while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. But the person who loves God is the one whom God recognises. So what about eating meat that has been offered to idols? Well, we all know that an idol is not really a god and that there is only one god and there may be so-called gods both in heaven and on earth. And some people actually worship many gods and many lords. But we know that there is only one God, the Father, who created everything, and we live for him. There is only one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom God made everything, and through whom we have been given life. However, not all believers know this. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real. So when they eat food that has been offered to idols, they think of it as worship of real gods and their weak consciences are violated. It is true that we can't win God's approval by what we eat. We don't lose anything if we don't eat, and we don't gain anything if we do. But you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. For if others see you, and with your superior knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, won't they be encouraged to violate their conscience by eating food that has been offered to an idol? So because of your superior knowledge, a weak believer for whom Christ died will be destroyed. And when you sin against other believers by encouraging them, them to do something that they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. So that what a, if what I eat causes another believer to sin, I will never eat meat again as long as I live, for I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. Can we go to 23, please? So I suggest that a weak believer, when they do something that they think is wrong, they blunt their conscience. And then possibly it could be easier for them to sin the next time. And then again, and the result may be more serious, a more serious outcome. So the Apostle Paul here has, um, has laid down the principles of not putting things which, stump, which cause people to stumble in believers' way. We know that later on he says that, um, that, that all things, he mentions that yes, you can eat meat that is given to idols. But what we've got here is an association with idol worship. And it does need to, to be looked in, and I've lost the time, sadly. But, but um, what we've got is where, where, where there's eating meat at the temple um, associated with idol worship is different to buying meat in the marketplace where there is no idol worship associated. And that's, what, that's, that's the difference that he brings out uh, later. In Re I'll just say in Revelation chapter 2, we, we have a message to two churches. Um, and in both of those churches, we actually will just uh, have a look at the text um, on uh, 20, 24, yep, to Pergamum and Thyatira. We can see there that... Um, this problem of eating food sacrificed to idols is, is brought out. And specifically, um, it was a stumbling block. And then the second church, there was a tolerance of false teaching in the church. And um, that was the Lord was not, was not happy and was pointing that out.
let's look at um, chapter, uh, sorry, verse, mm. not verse, no, number 25 of the slides, please. So in chapter 10 of uh, 1 Corinthians, I am saying that food offered to idols has some, am I saying that food offered to idols has some significance or that idols are real gods? Not at all. No, I am saying these sacrifices are offered to demons and not to God. So no confusion, that there's no real, there's no reality in the idols. So these sacrifices, and they're not being made to Yahweh. They are being offered to demons. That's, that's a bit, uh, yeah, that's, that's um, I, was, I find that quite frightening because of uh, thinking back to um, the history, going right back to history, and you can do this yourselves, Demons are not new. They're not a new thing. And, um, yeah, so I'll just put, yeah, put that in there. Next slide, 26, please. So we noticed that um, we had in, in 1 Corinthians there, we had a verse that went like this. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. But the person who loves God is the one whom God recognises. So, if we have knowledge, if we've studied scripture and we've got a good idea of, um, of what we should say when we see something, let's be careful how we, how we uh, approach that. Let's be careful because um, we saw back in Acts for the whole um, um, important aspect of unity within the church guidance was given and uh, we must be conscious that um, if the Holy Spirit is here he brings unity and if we're acting under the Holy Spirit's un uh, leading then um, if we say something well we won't be acting by the Holy Spirit's leading if we say things that are going to um, cause disunity on items such as principles of conscience where, where there, um, some believers have different views so with our freedom we must be careful how we approach each other so Romans 14 another great chapter to read about how to live together let's stop condemning each other and decide instead to live a life in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall So when we live our lives, we've got to be conscious that we, well, we do live as witness. We are witnessed all around us by the young children in the Sunday school and uh, one another. And we must be conscious that we want to live our lives led by the Holy Spirit and the principle of not wishing to cause harm and cause people to stumble. Um, should be foremost in our mind. And the principle above that is to treat each other with love, love your neighbour as yourself. So the key points uh, are in the next slide, thanks. A knowledge of God's word equips us for making moral decisions. And we should take care that we don't cause other believers to stumble. And our last slide, please. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. So my apologise, I apologise for being so rushed. I, I, um, but I do hope that uh, we can take on board those principles and those scriptures. And this week, if we do get time, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 10 and Romans 14 would certainly be a good read and um, yeah we'll, we'll just close with a word of prayer a loving heavenly father we, we thank you for this example that you've given us through your word of the life of Daniel today father we know that uh, tomorrow even today there will be opportunities for us to stand for you and we pray that you will help us to Stand, Father, according to your word, to give you honour and glory. 
We thank you, Father, for the courage that you gave Daniel. And we pray for this courage to be found in us too. We pray that your Holy Spirit would give us this courage to stand before those we, we love and those at work and those we know in our everyday lives that we may um, be your witnesses. And we pray, Lord, that um, what we have learned today won't be just head knowledge, but that, Lord, that you will make us conscious each time that the opportunity comes up to us where we might cause someone to stumble. We pray that you will speak to us and help us to draw back mindful of um, this is a person who loves you and we will want no harm to come to them by what we say or do. Father, thank you again for this time and we commit ourselves to you and your care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.